coming in. Brilliant. There we go. So good morning um, and welcome to this webinar on self-assessments for landlords with less than a um, thousand homes. Um, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Anthea Chilton. I'm a sector learning and development lead at the Housing Ombudsman Service. Um, I'm going to hand over to Verity in just a moment and he's going to lead the session today. Um, but before I do, just to let you know, today's going to be recorded. So if you have any colleagues that couldn't make it this morning or if you'd like to kind of refer back to it uh, later on, if there's anything you want to um, look at again, um, that will be available on our Centre for Learning through our website for you. So that'll be um, available to look at. Um, if I could please ask as well, and I think you all have actually, so that's brilliant. But if you could please pop yourselves on mute um, just at the, the beginning of the session, that'd be brilliant. Um, and there will be a chance to ask some questions a bit later on. But if you could please um, keep on mute just for now, that would be brilliant. Um, just before I hand over to Verity, just one last thing to say. Um, there will be an evaluation form that I will pop in the chat at the end. Um, it should only take a few minutes to complete, but if you could, um, if you do have a chance to do that for us, we'd really appreciate your feedback because it helps us to, these sessions are for you, so it really helps us to kind of shape future sessions and, and think about what we'll, we'll do for next time. So if you could please um, give us your feedback at the end, that would be brilliant. Um, but I think it looks like everybody's here and people have sort of stopped joining, so that's really good. I will hand over to you, Verity. Thanks, Anthea. Morning, everyone. My name is Verity Richards. I'm one of the heads of service here at the Housing Ombudsman. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we'll be going through a short presentation um, before we hand over for some pre-submitted questions um, and an opportunity to, um, to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, she says, moving on the slides. Um, Anthea's already um, given a little bit of uh, housekeeping. So as we've said, um, we will be recording this. It is going to be published, uh, but we will also make sure that you get a copy of the slides after the webinar as well, so that you can um, refer to them and they will be on our website. So they will be there for you. Um, and as Anthea said, um, we will be sharing uh, a feedback form and I will be plugging it because we do really appreciate um, the, the feedback that we get. Uh, it's not about patting ourselves on the back. This is about helping us to shape what we provide to you um, as, as landlords. So, excuse me, I've had a cold recently, so you'll have to excuse me if I'm clearing my throat a little. So just before we start, um, a little bit about ourselves as the Housing Ombudsman Service. Um, obviously, you know about us because you are here uh, with us this morning, but it is sometimes um, helpful just to uh, just to remind ourselves um, and just to share some of the um, highlights of our of our work. So our vision is improving residents' lives and landlord services through housing complaints. Uh, we've shared here our um, values that we use. Um, when we're doing our work and when we're developing our work and that obviously includes how we've considered the complaint handling code itself more widely across our membership uh, we have over 1700 landlords um, most of which are housing associations um, but we also have a large number of local authorities and a number of voluntary members um, who are part of our membership um, we cover uh, one, uh, the 4.9 million households, uh, which is a phenomenal amount of residents that we can work with yourselves to improve those services um, and also to make sure that they're living in safe um, homes and receiving great services. So the focus for today is around the self-assessment process. Um, the self-assessment is the appendix to the complaint handling code and um, you'll see it there it's a table um, but it is also available on on our website for you to download separately um, in a word document if you prefer uh, to use that it's about really supporting organizations and helping yourselves to be able to set out exactly how you are complying with those uh, different provisions of the complaint handling code um, doing the self-assessment, it really should be more than a tick box activity. Uh, we are expecting organisations to really make the most of this opportunity. Um, it's a continuous review to improve those services and also demonstrate that you are doing that. We know that landlords are doing that work all the time. And all of us, we're all working together to improve those services and to really reflect on what we can do and change. The self-assessment is your opportunity to share that 
uh, with your residents and other stakeholders. It's also there to set out to your residents how you've ensured that complaints will be handled in line with the code. It's something that came across in our consultation about the complaint handling code. It's something which was really important to residents. So not only telling them, yes, we will handle complaints as set out in our policy, but really setting out how you will ensure that, how have you made sure that that will be the case. It is a requirement <clears throat> for that to be completed. So all landlords who are members of the scheme, uh, you are required to complete that self-assessment and ensure that it is um, also published on your website if you have them. I'm assuming that everybody here does. Um, if not, then you can look at publishing that in an alternative way, um, such as on your notice boards or sending it to residents. But those with a website, we would expect that to be published. It needs to be reviewed annually. When completing the self-assessment, we've highlighted here, it must cover all of those housing services that you provide as a landlord and highlighting that that's directly or indirectly. Um, so both directly and indirectly. So if you have a contractor that's providing your repair service, if you have a managing agent that's providing housing services, um, those must be covered in the self-assessment um, and must be considered. In terms of the self-assessment, beyond publishing them, raising that awareness, transparency and accountability to um, to residents, which is really important, we will be using it as an ombudsman service um, to monitor compliance with the complaint handling code. Because whilst the ombudsman has the power to issue a statutory code, and we have done through going through a consultation back in autumn last year, I've said this several times, but with great power comes great responsibility. So yes, we have the power to do so, but we now have a responsibility to monitor compliance. Um, and we will be using the self-assessment alongside other documentation as set out in our co-compliance framework to monitor that compliance. <clears throat> so in terms of doing the self-assessment itself, as I've already said, uh, we really want to encourage landlords to view this as far, far more than a tick box activity. It really shouldn't be. Um, it should be a really meaningful consideration of the approach that you're taking to handling complaints. An approach that we um, would suggest or um, organisations might wish to consider is to go through um, the steps which I've sort of shared here for you. So starting off with the opportunity to reflect and review on the current processes, reflecting on feedback that you may have had, outcomes perhaps from um, surveys, feedback from residents, um, findings from any of your uh, scrutiny activities or internal audits, depending on the um, approach that your organisation takes. And really reflecting on those and um, thinking about how you can use those to take forward your policy, but also your practice. Um, being compliant is more than having a, a compliant policy. It's about how you're embedding that in practice. If you do find somewhere in the complaint handling code, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that you feel needs further action, make sure that it's really effective. Um, make sure that those actions are being tracked. Uh, who will do them? When will they be completed by? How will you check that that's being completed? Um, I'm sure this is not, you know, new or groundbreaking to everyone, you know, to anybody, um, but, you know, consider an action plan, an action tracker, uh, just really useful to make sure that you have those in place and you're, you're monitoring those. Throughout the review, I uh, really want to highlight the importance of gathering and documenting evidence. So as I've already said, um, the self-assessment, it does need to be evidence. It's your point to assure how you have made sure that complaints will be handled in line with the code that will need documentation um, and evidence that you will want to be able to refer to. Um, that will help support residents to feel confident that you have indeed done all of your due diligence and everything is there for them. Um, and also for the ombudsman, because we will very likely ask for evidence if we are assessing you um, and your compliance with the code. Once you've gathered, documented your evidence, um, probably drafted your first draft um, of the self-assessment, um, 
take really take the time to scrutinise and challenge that self-assessment. Um, this webinar is being run for smaller organisations with less than a thousand properties. Um, and although I don't want to make a, a sweeping statement about you know, everyone's governance and, and arrangements, uh, one thing that we found in our discussions with landlords is um, the smaller organisations are quite often really close to their residents. They have a really strong uh, resident engagement. Here's a wonderful opportunity for you to engage with them. Um, they can scrutinise and, and challenge you. I'm sure nobody asks questions uh, as, as pertinently as residents about your services. So this is a really great opportunity to, to do that. Once you've been through that process and you've challenged and you're satisfied as an organisation that, yes, the um, self-assessment has been completed, it is the point where it will need approval and um, publication, so publishing um, that information. As I've already said, it does need to be on your website if you have one and ensuring that it's being approved by the governing body. And um, that is something that the member responsible for complaints should be doing. That's part of their responsibility um, on that governing body. So it's being published and approved and making sure that those changes are actually then being embedded. Um, considering ways that you can assure yourself that, yes, the policy is being completed, perhaps quality control checking letters, doing um, dip samples on complaints. There's lots of opportunities um, using your own approaches um, to make sure that those changes are being embedded. And whilst you're doing your self-assessment, just some food for thought um, for anyone that is doing those. Uh, complaints managers, uh, board members, it's, it's really everybody uh, to be sort of thinking about these questions and how you are ensuring that the self-assessment is meaningful. So is the policy and procedure in line with the code? Does it meet all of those requirements? Um, you know, the policy is going to set out your intentions and how you're going to handle it. Most of the code will be um, set out in your policy beyond the policy being correct as i've already mentioned embedding those changes well how are all of your um, staff or relevant contractors are they fully aware of those processes and how to raise those complaints and then handling them in time in line sorry with that policy um, ensuring that they are being processed effectively that the um, letters that you're sending are in line with the code and the approach that the um, handlers are taking um, is set out in the code. Again, I've already mentioned about consistency um, and then ensuring that during that embedding process, is it consistent? Depending on your organisational arrangements, you may have one person that handles all stage one complaints. You may have a contractor that handles repairs complaints. Um, it will be for you as an organisation to be satisfied that you have um, made sure that it is consistent regardless of who that complaint is being made to um, if it's a contractor if it's a member of staff that the resident will receive a consistent level of service um, i'm afraid i wouldn't be an ombudsman uh, or a member of the ombudsman if i wasn't mentioning uh, the dreaded record keeping uh, just a real reminder of the importance of making sure that you have those records in place um, both to record them and also to handle those complaints effectively um, they are such an invaluable source of insight for you, really considering the quality of that data, which is there. And then also, as I've said here, moving on to are you able to report those themes, those trends, are the processes being followed? So while you're doing that self-assessment, gathering that evidence, really thinking, how can we measure whether this is happening? Do we have everything that we need? In terms of evidence gathering, we've received quite a lot of um, queries about evidence gathering. What information would we expect to see um, as part of evidence gathering and set out in the complaint um, code self-assessment? And you can see here, I've mentioned, you know, a lot of the code will be referred to in your policy or procedure. Um, where you are recording that evidence, making sure that you're really clear um, about what that document is um, and where it is in the um, in the policy. So, for example, put the example here, complaints policy, page two, 2.1. 
that will make it really easy for a resident to go and look and say, well, actually, I want to check if that's the case. Uh, being really transparent about the um, where you are referring to. Um, links, if you are putting links in the, in the documents, that's absolutely fine. Just make sure that they work and be alert to changes during the year. I'm sure that you would be anyway, but it's just something that we have seen on occasion, um, making sure that those are there. I'd also highlight as well, make sure that it is very easy for residents to find this information on your website. So I hide it away, hidden away with multiple clicks. It should be something that is there um, for residents to refer to, and it should be easy for them to, to find that information. You may wish to refer to reports and publications. Again, that's absolutely fine. If you want to refer to, for example, an annual report or a case study or a feedback activity or a scrutiny panel, um, minutes, I don't know, you know, things which are already published. Again, reference those reports really clearly, provide the links, but just be really mindful about the timing of that report. Um, it's, re it's, it's really more from a resident's perspective, you know, as I've said here, more recent publications, they're much more likely to be viewed as reflecting current practices. Um, so just be aware of the timescales that you are referring to. And if you do need to do an update, then perhaps that could be something that you would be looking to to plan in. Learning and training. Um, parts of the code will ask for you know, evidence that complaint handlers are um, handling complaints in a particular way. Learning and training, be setting that out. Um, any of the training that's been delivered or attended. Um, just highlighting um, the importance of GDPR um, and not highlighting <clears throat> too much details about an individual or if somebody's easily identified, you know, their qualifications. I'm sure this is, you know, you'll be thinking about this anyway, but just keen to sort of point that out in terms of consideration. And if relevant, giving details of any refreshers, any of those dates which are completed, you could consider qualifications in there as well. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Depending on your um, your organisation, um, just being aware of those and being prepared that actually, you know, residents may ask for further information. Being confident about why you will or you won't provide um, that information to them. And again, I've already mentioned about scrutiny or audit activities, and um, that could be internally facing. So an internal audit could be externally facing. Um, it may be findings from your own scrutiny panel. It may be peer um, to peer reviews. Um, there's lots and lots of opportunities to to sort of set out those audit activities that have been completed and just being aware again, um, if you are referring to them as evidence, um, consider whether actually it'd be appropriate to publish that on your website. And if not, just be very clear about why you wouldn't release that um, again, mainly because you know, residents are very likely to ask for further information or to see a copy if they do see it there. Um, and, it, you know, we do recognise there may well be good reason as to why it wouldn't be appropriate to be released, um, but just be mindful of that when you are considering it. So sharing with you um, some examples um, of the self-assessments, um, I just highlight these are um, the old version of the self-assessment. These aren't the new ones, which is why you can see on the left hand one um, mentions to must and should. Obviously, all of the provisions of the code are mandatory, so are all must. Um, as the Ombudsman, we would recommend that you use the um, appendix, so the table, which is already set out there for you. Um, this will help you make sure that you are referring to each of the provisions as required and that you are providing um, clarity around the evidence, any commentary and explanations that you are providing. Um, but it isn't, a, it isn't mandatory for you to use that specific form. And as you can see here, um, one of the landlords on the left hand side with the green badge on it, you know, they have chosen to do so. They've been really clear about the um, evidence that they're referring to. So they're referring to their policy, referring to specific sections. Um, and then you can see there about the evidence of a, a, re a review um, of a sample of complaints. Um, so that's how they have set that out there. In terms of um, alternatives, 
So this is actually uh, the one on the top right. That's actually a council. Um, they had taken the decision to put all of the information from the self-assessment, but to repackage it into a slightly different style. So, so you can see there, setting out that mandatory detail, um, confirming whether they are or aren't compliant, and then referring to um, their evidence and information um, as below. Um, you'll see there that that is orange with the scales. We would review those on an individual basis. Um, there may well be very good reason as to why you want to take an alternative, particularly um, knowing your residents, um, if there are particular requirements for them or feedback that you have from resident reviewers, um, that actually the style is it would need to be changed for accessibility, um, then that's absolutely fine. We would review those and we would look at them on a case by case basis. Um, just the sort of warning, or not warning, but just be very, very clear that all of those um, different requirements are uh, being addressed and that you are meeting and going through all of those. The last one that you can see here, um, this is um, another organisation uh, with absolutely the best of intentions. Here, it's they've tried to make it really clear to their residents, very straightforward, um, to provide that assurance that yes, they do indeed comply with those different um, provisions of the complaint handling code. Um, but as you can see, there is no evidence um, referred to. Uh, there isn't any explanation. There isn't any detail um, that would provide any assurance that that is anything other than a statement. Um, may well be right, but the self-assessment should and must include all of that evidence um, and commentary. So just being mindful about, about those styles um, which are there for you. So some food for thought in terms of publishing. As I mentioned, so publishing, uh, I've already mentioned about it being easy to find and access online. Um, be mindful of your click through rates. So the number of clicks that somebody needs to find that information, uh, more access, it promotes that view of perception of being transparent um, as much as anything else. So just be mindful of that. When you are um, writing your explanations and providing that evidence using plain English, um, making sure that it is very clear to residents, it shouldn't be jargon, it should be very clear. It's there for them to be able to understand and to be clear how they're going to be um, having their complaints handled. Mentioned about links already, uh, just keep on top of them if they are still working and make sure that you're picking those up uh, where you need to. Highly recommend keeping your documents very clearly dated. Uh, it's really, really useful for version control, just making sure that you are referring to the most recent information um, that is on your website. Making sure when you do your publication that the governing body's response, so their approval and re their response to the self-assessment is also published um, so that um, they can confirm, yes, we have reviewed this. Yes, we are satisfied that this has been assured and this is a true reflection of the policies, procedures and practices of this organisation. And once you've done all of that publication, really think about how you're going to raise awareness. Um, how are you going to ensure that residents are aware? How are you going to ensure that your staff are aware? Um, it's really important that everybody takes accountability and is aware of how complaints need to be handled. Um, so just be considerate, you know, consider those as well. If through any of the self-assessments, um, an organisation identifies that there is non-compliance, um, we would expect uh, the organisation to be taking action in order to achieve compliance. So through that review process, going through the evidence um, and making necessary changes to ensure that they are compliant. Um, if there is a reason that an organisation is unable to, so I've mentioned some of our organisations, they don't have a website. We wouldn't expect a landlord to create a website, pay for the hosting of a website simply to meet the needs of the code. But then if that is the case, they must set out how they have met the intentions in an alternative way. So publishing on the website, the intention is to ensure that residents have full awareness and access to the self-assessment and information about complaints. As I've suggested, you could put that on a notice board, you could send that out to individual residents, depending on the size of the organisation. Um, some of our
landlords have got, you know, two, three, four properties, you know, that would potentially work for them. We're not suggesting that they have to um, do it specifically that way, but we would expect to review how they have met those intentions. Even if there is an alternative put in place, it must be reported as non-compliant um, because all of the um, requirements of the code are must, they are mandatory, it must be reported as non-compliant. We'd ex then expect to see the explanation as to why and the alternative that has been put in place. When we're reviewing all of the self-assessments as the Ombudsman as part of our duty to monitor compliance with the code, we will be assessing um, those self-reports of non-compliance and we will be looking at each on and um, considering them on their own merits. Um, we may intervene and take action. Um, that would be where we're not satisfied that the um, alternate, the excuse me, the alternate way that has been proposed actually does fully meet the intentions. It could be because the timescale for achieving compliance isn't reasonable, um, or it could be that the landlord hasn't given um, a reasonable uh, reason, you know, a rational and logical reason as to why they can't comply with the code. But we will consider those um, on a, an individual basis, I'm not anticipating seeing a huge volume of these. I think landlords have been you know, very clear about how they need to comply, but we will consider them. Um, as we would uh, current, and we have been um, previously, uh, we still have the power to issue a complaint handling failure order if a landlord doesn't comply with an intervention by the housing ombudsman. Um, consistent with all of our approaches, we will give the landlord the opportunity to put things right. Um, they will continue and the time scale, sorry, to do so. Um, but in the hopefully, and I'm sure it will be, the rare occasions that a landlord refuses to go to or is unable to do so um, or states that it won't, uh, we can and we will look to issue complaint handling failure orders. Um, that approach is set out in our code compliance framework and it's also set out in our complaint handling failure order guidance, both of which are on the website and there are links in this um, presentation for you to review. Um, so those are there. I, again, I hope that that won't be necessary. I know that there is an appetite to comply, um, but I do need to make everyone aware that that may be the case. <clears throat> so in terms of the guidance and support that is available, I've already mentioned we have our um, code guidance. We've got our frequently asked questions, which we are regularly reviewing. So as we're going through these webinars, um, as we're meeting with landlords, as we're receiving inquiries, we are regularly reviewing them and updating them. Um, when we are doing so, we're setting out the reasons for any of those changes and dating them so that you can see very clearly where there has been any change. We have a huge amount of key topic information. Um, such as the guidance for governing bodies and member responsible for complaints. Um, they pose some really useful questions that um, board may want to consider. And if you're a complaints handler, it's still useful to go and look at because those are the questions which are likely to be coming to you, I'm sure, from the board or your exec team. So do take a look at those. We've got a lot of spotlight reports. Um, which are out. So we have our knowledge and information management report with the recommendations and findings that's available to you. Um, attitudes, rights and respect. We also have our recent noise evaluation. Um, they are there. Um, they are under the key topics. They are now mo much more broken down into chunks, sort of bite sizes, so you can go and refer to them. I really encourage you to go and look at the recommendations as part of the self-assessment opportunities to take things forward there uh, within your organisation. We also have our complaint handling failure order reports. These are published quarterly. Um, they are beyond, you know, they go beyond just individual complaint handling failure orders. We also share interventions which have been completed with organisations and then how um, those interventions have been successful and findings from our work. There are lessons that can be learned there. So you can go and look at those um, if you wish to do so. We also have the Ombudsman's learning reports. Um, those generally feature um, individual um, landlords uh, that have been subject to a investigation under our powers under 
paragraph 49 of the scheme. Um, there's actually one that's been published today, the plug for the website. So there's another one that's been published um, today. Um, it is a large organisation. Um, it's it's one of the uh, the bigger uh, housing associations that you can go and look at. Um, but I'm sure that there will be things that you can consider um, as, as slightly smaller organisations. Their learning is there for you. There's also the duty to monitor team, many of whom are in the room today, um, happy to answer questions and provide um, responses to you. Uh, you can see there, this is the email address at compliance at housing-ombudsman.org.uk. Uh, we aim to respond to you within five working days. I'm very pleased to say that we have um, almost always met that. The only time that we haven't so far um, has been where we've been waiting for publications. So the team is here. We're more than happy to answer any of those questions. And we recognise how important it is that you get those responses so you can take things forward to comply. So please do email um, and a member of the team will be in contact with you. In terms of keeping in touch, um, I'm sure you are already doing a lot of this, but you can follow us on um, X. I can't quite get my head around calling it X. Twitter, I think it will always be Twitter for me. Um, we do do a lot of publications on um, LinkedIn, our newsletter, and then obviously the um, the website, which is there um, for you to, to sign up to and to get that information. And you'll be pleased to know I've pretty much stayed on time for target uh, completion. So we are now able to answer some questions and I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to my colleagues from the GT to monitor team. Good morning, everybody. My name is Maria. Um, I am going to be um, putting forward the questions that we've had pre-submitted and my colleague um, Kirsty um, is going to be answering them for you so please if you do have any other questions pop them in the chat but hopefully we can cover uh, some of the, the questions that you have already so my first question um, has been we are a registered provider and a managing agent for another registered provider that completes the sign up process on their behalf has sorry as point 5.1 of the self-assessment, it says landlords must have a single policy in place for dealing with complaints. Should this be our complaints policy and procedure or the other registers providers um, complaints policy and procedure? Sorry, it's quite quite wordy, so please bear with me. Um, and then the second part was also regarding uh, where we only ha uh, have Two stages, so as a managing agent or as a third party, should that be included within the two stages? So over to you, Kirsty. So the managing agent setup can be quite tricky. So if you're not sure, as Verity's already said about sending an email to compliance, please do feel free. We have had quite a few of them, so we're more than happy to come back to clarify, depending on your individual setup, because part of this will depend on what the contractual arrangement is between the landlord acting as the managing agent and the substantive landlord. If you as the managing agent are being asked to, or part of the contractual responsibility, is to then respond to complaints on the landlord's behalf, it's the substantive landlord's mm -hmm. responsibility to ensure that you are responding in accordance with the code. And when they produce that annual performance report, they include that data in that report. If you're already submitting a report to us because you have your own stock, it's open to you whether or not you want to include that information. But we'd say just clarify that that's um, data in, you know, relating to your managing agent responsibilities rather than you as a landlord. Um, in terms of the kind of second point to that, if you are a managing agent, what we say is, a resident shouldn't have to go through your complaint procedure if you're dealing with it on the landlord's behalf and then at completion of that then go through the substantive landlord's complaint procedure because in effect that's just delaying them being able to bring the complaint to us if they were unhappy so the setup either needs to be as the managing agent you deal with stage one stage two it can come to us potentially you deal with stage one the landlord deals with stage two however you contractually decide to set it up that just needs to be clear in your complaint policy um, and at the end of the complaint procedure or stage one, stage two, you're very clear what the resident's next step is and to who that um, any escalation needs to be sent to. 
That's great. Thanks, Kirsty. So another one we've had is we are planning or currently going through a merger. How long after the merger will we be, will we be required to submit our self-assessment? So whilst the merger is going through, each respective landlord needs to be continuing to progress complaints in accordance with their own code, um, in, in accordance with the policy and the code. Once the merger has been finalised, though, the uh, new complaint policy and new self-assessment need to be submitted to us within 12 weeks. Thank you very much. Um, another question we have, we are undergoing an exceptional circumstance that is preventing us from complying with the complaint handling code. What should we do? So 8.5 of the new code specifies that if a landlord is experiencing some sort of business critical incident, so something like a cyber attack, which we're really aware is becoming more prevalent in the sector, and it's going to impact on their complaint handling. So, for example, even if it's just um, uh, in like disrupting your repair service, that will have implications for your complaint handling as well. So you need to make sure you're letting your residents know through the website, you know, social media, whatever else. But then you're also letting us know and letting us know how long you're expecting the disruption to be, what the recovery plan is, and just keeping in touch with us so that if we get any inquiries from residents, we're able to, um, to update them as well. Great, thank you. And um, one more, as a voluntary member, when should we submit and publish our self-assessment? So assuming that as a voluntary member, you have less than a thousand properties that needs to be sent to us at the same time you publish your TSMs or are 12 weeks after the end of your financial year. Thank you, Kirsty. So that's all my pre-submitted questions. Um, I know there is a couple in the chat. So Kirsty, Verity, do you, would you like to answer those? Let's have a look. So the self-assessment going online. So just to bear in mind, the self-assessment is one element of the documents that need to be submitted to us. So the self-assessment is part of that annual complaint performance and service improvement report. We really needed a catchy title, but I don't even know what the acronym for that is. And the governing body's response. So all of that will need to be submitted to us along with like links to your complaint policy and things like that. We're doing some final functionality testing, so the link will be made live at the beginning of June because obviously the first submissions aren't due till the end of the month. So that will be available on our website from the beginning of June. And the self-report on non-compliance against the code. Is that a queer, Claire, is that about the um, one of the provisions in the annual report? No, Verity mentioned it in her presentation. I didn't get the detail of what she said. I just wanted to ask if she could repeat it. Yeah, sure. So when you're doing your self-assessment and you find that one of, you know, one or several, hopefully not too many, um, provisions of the complaint handling code are not um, complied with, then when you are doing, we would expect that in the published self-assessment that you put on your website, you clearly state, we do not comply, and then give an explanation as to why, then um, how you are meeting the intention of that code um, provision in an alternative way. And if necessary, um, how when you intend to achieve compliance, because um, we recognise this is the first year. Um, so for example, we have had several queries from organisations that have said, well, actually, we can do everything except from the governing body's response because we've got a meeting on a week later because obviously governance meetings are very much planned in advance and, and saying, well, actually, you can put that on. You can put that on your self-assessment that you're going to achieve compliance and the date that it will be complied with. And we'll look at those on a case by case basis when you're doing the submission to uh, the ombudsman. Um, when you're filling it in, so with the form, as Kirsty said, it is going through final functionality testing. Um, it won't be through the portal, just to clarify, because I know we've had a couple of questions about it being through the portal. It won't be through the portal. Um, it will be a standalone 
uh, for, for people to use. We're not expecting um, organisations to copy and paste everything from their self-assessment. It's a link to the self-assessment and then confirming uh, each individual provision. Um, so if you are, when you are doing that submission, if you've said, no, I don't comply, we don't comply with this provision, we would require you to, to confirm that that is the case. And then we will look at it um, fully expecting there to be a small number of instances, depending on those organisations, as to very good reason as to why the code can't be complied with. Um, but the alternative arrangement is what's really important. So that's why we're saying we'll look at them on a case by case basis. Does that answer your question, Claire? Yes, it does. Makes me want to ask another one, though. <laughs> um, when you say your governing body, do you mean the board or can yeah. the board delegate to a committee to approve the policy? No, we'd expect it to be the board um, rather than a governing committee. They can they can delegate doing the self-assessment to the committee and reviewing it. But that final um, approval will need to be the board. Thank you. So, Suzanne, I'll pick up your um, query next. Where there's contractual relationship with the landlord and managing agent, can a landlord simply adopt the managing agent's complaint policy subject to it complying with the code rather than it developing its own policy? We aren't prescriptive on how landlords arrive at their complaint policy. Ultimately, that's an operational decision for landlords them, you know, themselves. Um, what the landlord will need to do, though, is make sure it completes its own self-assessment to assure itself that the policy it's adopted is compliant. Um, you know, we'd always encourage landlords to kind of look at other peer landlords to see what they've got in their complaint policy. But ultimately, the self-assessment is there as a kind of um, scrutiny so that you can check that complaint policy meets what we're looking for. Um, but as I say, how they arrive at that is um, the content is is largely an operational decision. Um, Rivka, some of our provisions are part compliant, part not. The evidence we provide would detail this, but do we respond as compliant or non-compliant? Verity, do you want to follow up on what you were just explaining? Yeah, absolutely. So for the this year, um, when we're doing these, we'd expect them to be non-compliant, uh, to be recorded as non-compliant so that we can then take a look at where it is partly, um, that, you know, where it is partly or, or not. Um, and then that way we can work with the landlord to discuss whether actually it is compliant, but <clears throat> excuse me, whether it actually ultimately it is compliant. Um, or if it's not compliant and are they, uh, is the alternative appropriate? So I would expect organisations to err on the side of, um, I don't want to say caution, but, you know, the, the side of non-compliance. You know, we're not going to intervene and, and hit people with a big stick because they've said they're non-compliant. We want to be able to support organisations um, so that, you know, we can identify and look at them. Um, Sam, thank you uh, for your question. As a very small organisation, we don't have a complaint team in our staff number of five. Are there any concession for small landlords in relation to time and content as this one size fits all approach for self-assessment doesn't seem very fair? We do understand that for small landlords, it is going to be challenging, but ultimately the purpose of the code is to ensure that residents receive the same service regardless of the size of their landlord. So it is necessary and a requirement of all landlords who are a member of our scheme um, to, to do the self-assessment and the report. Um, it's also a requirement that there is a dedicated complaint officer within that staff of five. So although they may well have other responsibilities and duties within the organisation, they do still, um, there does still need to be some sort of complaint officer in role. Um, and you know, the self-assessment and the reporting will need to be done, I'm afraid. And I can see that um, Sean's also commented that the staff of one and I'm, yeah, Kirsty's comments about consistency across that um, is, is the position of the Ombudsman. If there is something that is specific, um, that is more challenging or that you are finding quite difficult, that is the purpose of the team. Um, being able to answer those. 
but there is a requirement for the self-assessments to be completed and returned. Um, that's across all organisations. Um, it was part of the consultation that was completed um, and it is really in response to the findings and requirements of the Social Housing Regulation Act. So I do appreciate that it is um, potentially challenging for some smaller organisations, but it is a requirement um, to do so. In terms of the self-assessment, um, whilst what we have said here is an example um, and a recommended approach, as I said, depending on your organisation, it may not be necessary um, for you to go through uh, all of those different stages, those different steps. Um, you will know your organisation and Sam um, has highlighted about having very different relationships with tenants. Absolutely recognise um, that that is the case. So you may well find that actually you don't need to go through all of those different processes um, and reflecting on it. It may well be that you can do that together with your residents um, in a you know, a workshop session, it will very much depend on those. And it's just being able to explain how you've done that and assured yourselves with those residents um, and making sure that you've got that right approval from your board or management, you know, depending on your arrangements or management committee, it does have to be um, at that board level though, uh, with the member responsible for complaints taking the lead um, on those. So as we get more and more information that's coming in, um, so, for example, the comments here about so one size fits all and maybe we could look to um, review the work that's being done during the year by uh, different landlords, different groups. We have a whole, we've got over 1700, a huge number of landlords. Um, we can now take that time to look at actually do we need to look at a self-assessment toolkit for smaller organisations um, and absolutely will intend to look to do that work. Um, this will be the first year that we will have had full visibility of all landlords um, in our membership. Um, so absolutely, I'm sure that there will be many things that we can learn and share um, because there's lots of organisations we don't hear from or we don't see at all. And whilst I'd love to say that that is because everything is going swimmingly and everything is fantastic and I really want that to be the case, um, we we won't know until we, we've had time to go through that information and share that learning onwards, which is the intention of this you know, this work that we do and more widely at the Ombudsman. Um, Mike's asked if the video of the session will be made available. Yes, it will be on our website in due course. Absolutely. Any last questions? No? Okay. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit early um, today, let people have their 12 minutes back of their busy days, because I know that um, time is, is very precious, particularly oh, on that side. Apologies, Claire's come back. You just snuck in there, Claire. Well done. So Claire's just asked, if you're taking the approach of working with landlords to become com compliant this year, will you not then consider this in complaint reviews? Do you mean um, sort of reviewing the self-assessments, Claire, or do you mean adjudicating individual complaints? I mean, will you take, I, I, I'm just thinking there's a chance if we reported a, a quite a significant number of non-compliance, mm -hmm. would you take that into account when you were adjudicating complaints? That's that's the right wording, thank you. Um, yeah, so we wouldn't take that into account automatically when we were adjudicating those complaints because adjudication will look at how the policy has been applied for an individual case. So, for example, if you were saying, and I'm sorry, I'm picking on the website because it is just the easiest, but if you were saying, well, we're non-compliant because we don't have a website, but that complaint is still being handled in line with the provisions of the code, well, it wouldn't, that wouldn't be relevant to that individual complaint, which is what we would be adjudicating on. If it was, um, for example, that actually that the complaint couldn't be responded, we can't respond to complaints within timescales and they weren't responded to within those um, policy timescales set out in the code, well, then that would impact on the individual complaint handling. So that would be considered um, as part of that. But I think it's probably, you know, it, it's there will be instances where landlords are not complying and there will probably be quite good reason. 
and there will always be a circumstance where a landlord has got policies and procedures which are compliant with the code but time scales for example aren't met again with really good reason so one that comes up quite a lot is about stage one um so does, can a complaint be withdrawn um because a resident wants to wait for information from their uh, data subject access request we've certainly seen that as a query um before now um and our expectation would be well actually write to the resident, explain that at your request, you've asked for this complaint to be paused, um, give them a deadline um, to give an update to you so you're not drifting that complaint or you're not so sort of wondering what's happening with it. Um, and that will be responded to outside of timescales, but that's down to the resident's choice, which is really important. Um, and we wouldn't, uh, we very, depending on the circumstances of every case, I'm afraid that is a very ombudsman response, um, we would be very unlikely um, to look at that um as as being a, a negative so does that answer your question claire yeah thank you well they're all coming chris in has just <laughs> yeah, chris has just dro dropped a message at this stage most of our evidence is just going to say stated in the policy as we deal with more complaints following the new code we'll be able to give more examples as evidence is that okay do you mean in the self-assessment, Chris, confirming that you are compliant with the code? Yes, yeah, in the self-assessment, yeah. So usually the self policy, so that would be the right approach, but then the qualitative information. So as you start to deal with complaints from the 1st of April, that data and information will be reflected in the annual report next year as examples of, you know, your complaint performance ultimately against the code rather than in the self-assessment. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just thinking like the first year, we might not have a lot of complaints to refer to as evidence, um, but in future years, we, we will hopefully so. But yeah, I just wanted to check that was that was right. Yeah, and I think it's probably worth saying as well, you know, the, on, on, on your point, there, Chris, about not having that many complaints, like, we absolutely recognise that complaint numbers in themselves tell you nothing except from the number of complaints which have come to an organisation. We, we wouldn't be using those as a measure of we need to look at this organisation because they've got loads of complaints um, or they don't have any complaints. We would be using that as part of a wider picture of considering complaint handling. Um, we are really clear on that with the code um, that high numbers of complaints shouldn't be a barrier. But similarly, low numbers of complaints shouldn't be a concern as long as you're happy that it is genuinely because residents are happy. And that if that is the case, fantastic, brilliant news. That's what we want to see. Um, but being sure that that is the case rather than a barrier, that would be yeah. my only thing on that, which I'm sure you all agree with. You are all here for the same things, really, aren't we? So thank fantastic. You. So thank you ever so much. Um, I am definitely going to wrap up now. If there are questions, oh, Zoe's just snuck uh, a question in. Um, Zoe and anyone else, just I'm conscious of time. If it's okay, what we'll do is we'll take away those. Oh, they're coming in hot and fast now. What we'll do is we'll take these questions um, away and we'll make sure that we share them um, with all of yourselves who've attended this session. So you can see the questions which have come um, through and then we'll, we'll be able to um, share that with you. And again, as I've said, what we do as part of these webinars is that we review the, um, the sort of key themes which are coming up so that we can refresh our frequently asked questions. So thank you. It is really helpful for us to see what queries you're having or any challenges or the barriers you're facing because it is important that we inform the work that we're doing. Anthea has shared um, the feedback form and please 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 do give us feedback and mm. um, do tell us about things that we can do differently ideas for things that we could do in future. Um, we do have another two webinars which um, you may have already seen so one which is focusing on the annual complaints performance and service improvement report Kirsty's absolutely right, it's not very snappy, but that's what we've got. Um, and then there'll be a further webinar which will go through the submissions process um, just to make sure that organisations are, are comfortable with, with using our form and, and can ask any questions about it at that point. Um, so I'm sure we will probably see you there. Um, I hope that this has um, been useful. Um, if you have any suggestions, please do let us know using the form and have a really good rest of the day.
Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.